Almighty God, we have heard your words to us in Holy Scripture and know your call to each of us. In every age, you have spoken through the voices of prophets, pastors, and teachers. We give you thanks that over the years we have heard you speak to us through the preaching of your word in this place. Grant that those who preach in this place may proclaim the crucified and risen Christ and interpret your word with sensitivity and insight, that we may hear that word inwardly and respond to it in all our life. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Please be seated. Come to him, a living stone, a rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. In Sunday school, one Sunday morning, the teacher said to the class, Now, the Bible tells us about God. Now, think about the Bible stories you've heard. And can you tell me something about God? What, what's God like? And one little fellow said, well, I'm really happy that God is left-handed like me. <laughs> and the teacher said, okay, I haven't quite figured that out from Scripture. Johnny, how, how do you know that God is left-handed? Well, when Jesus went back to heaven, he sat down on the right hand of God, so God must be left-handed because he keeps doing things. <laughs> The scriptures are filled with pictorial image, images that speak to us indeed about the nature of who God is and how God acts in the world, and yet images that sometimes are just as much confusing as they may illuminate for us something about the divine will. In this reading for this morning, for this anniversary celebration, we have a portion of the letter of Peter where Peter is using an image, he's using several images actually, to talk about God and also to talk about like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, come to him a living stone, a living stone. I mean, how is a stone alive? A living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, this time, the people, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. <clears throat> the author here is concerned in this letter with the practical consequence of faith in Jesus Christ and what this means for everyday life, how families get along, whether to obey the emperor, the relationship with the non-Christian community around them. But he is also aware that faith in Jesus is not simply an individual choice. Christianity is not a religion for the individual. And while our encounter, our wrestling with the claims of Jesus Christ, and the decision about what we're going to do about those claims, what we do about the living word, is certainly an individual choice. How the faith is lived out is not. It involves community. It involves a community of believers in relationship with and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. The word for stone here is not the word for a rock, not, Peter may have been playing on that, of course, in terms of his name, Petros, the stone, the rock, but the word here is for a prepared stone, a stone used for building prepared, ready for use. So there is this balancing act between personal righteousness and the need to live out this calling with and among others. It's an interesting word picture that Peter paints here because, of course, he's not referring to a building at all, but to a people. In the first century AD, there were no Christian church buildings at all. The church was very much a gathering of pilgrim people, a faithful community, but the church existed wherever they came together. 
wherever they came together, in a field, under a tree, in somebody's house, wherever, there was the church. Today, when we gather to celebrate the 50th anniversary, we are marking the 50th anniversary of a building, of this building. But we are, at least I hope, thinking of far more than wood and glass, wiring and shingles, but of a people, a people of faith, a people who discovered a place, well, I guess, first of all, who created a place where they could discover and encounter God, a place they could set apart to be used for that, for that gathering, to be gathered in, to be gathered in for comfort and for care, but also to be gathered in for challenge, to be gathered in in order to know how life could be lived how life could be lived in all its fullness. Not to accept the simple answers, or the answers that so often the world would have us believe are all that is important, but to come to the point of knowing that there is far more, and that God really so oftentimes pushes us out of our comfortable spaces into places where we really encounter God. And those spaces might often be uncomfortable places. We are blessed in this place in order to be a blessing for the world around us. But things do matter. Actually, there's a bishop, um, I think his name, a bishop of Durham who's just left Durham, and he had a wonderful little line that says, matter matters, stuff is important. Jesus became incarnate and dwelt among us, so the physical reality really does matter. This building matters. We are a sacramental people. We know that things matter. Bread and wine, water, oil. All of it speaks to us something about God's presence here among us. It is not surprising that physical reality should touch us in this way. For a major distinguishing fact of our faith tradition has been that God redeems the created order. That God is present here in the reality of the world around us. The physical matters. Only, I guess, one reason why we ought to be paying attention to the world around us. But for people of faith, there is a danger of over-focusing on these symbols. The water in baptism doesn't do anything of itself, but it is a symbol of God's life, giving power of birth and rebirth into God's kingdom. And so, too, this building is not just a place to gather, not some kind of home for the God that inhabits all creation. You heard the psalm of the Old Testament reading this morning, um, speaking about the way in which the God that all of the creation could not contain, how much less this place, the temple, how much less was this place the only place where God could be found. But this place is a symbol of something much greater, of a people, of a holy nation, to quote the epistle for today, of God's own people who are gathered and then sent. I hope you'll um, give me the indulgence for just a few moments of waxing, um, I don't know what, not poetical, um, of indulging my remembrances. Um, when I got the letter, I said this actually to a couple of people, when I got the letter from Warren uh, saying that this anniversary was taking place and inviting uh, us to come, it was scary. Uh, not scary, the fact of coming back and being here. This pulpit actually feels like heavy. Um, try not to go on too long, Warren, so you, you did sleep better last night. You don't have to be too long a nap this morning, so. Um, but what scared me about the letter was it was St. Mary's Church is celebrating the 50th anniversary. And the first Sunday that I was rector in this place, I guess actually I technically wasn't even rector at that point, I hadn't been inducted, but the first Sunday that I led worship in this building um, was the 25th anniversary of this building. And I, when I opened the letter and read that, I thought, where'd the last 25 years go? Uh, just boom, it disappeared, it was gone. But the funny thing was, um, I think about this last night at the, at the banquet, which 25 years ago was in the high school, not the middle school, because the middle school wasn't there. Um, I met Fred Best, who was the mayor. And Fred Best is still the mayor. 